Hi everyone and welcome to Is Your Community Playing Fair? California's Fair Play Act, AB 2404, and Gender Discrimination in Youth Sports. Co-sponsored by California Women's Law Center and Legal Aid at Work. This webinar is hosted by the Legal Aid Association of California, also known as LAC. My name is Jenna Mowit, and I'm the trainings coordinator here at LAC. We are the membership organization for California's civil legal aid nonprofits. Our job is to advocate in the legislature, in the courts, and with the State Bar of California on behalf of the community of nonprofits that serve low-income Californians. In addition to our online and in-person trainings, LAC provides coordination and advocacy for increased funding to support organizations like yours. Today's session is presented by Amy Poyer and Kim Turner. Before we get started, we want to mention a few logistical notes. If you're having any technical difficulties with the GoToWebinar system, please call 877-582-7011. If you have any specific questions about this webinar, you can email me at trainings at lockonline.org, and I will try to get back to you before the webinar ends. Everyone on this call is muted, so if you have any questions, please feel free to send them to us using the chat box. This session will be recorded and materials will be posted online after the training, so you will have access to those within three to five business days. And now, I will pass it off to our presenters. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much, Jenna. Hi, everyone. This is Kim Turner, and I am a senior staff attorney with Legal Aid at Work Fair Play for Girls in Sports Project. And today, we are going to be talking about Is Your Community Playing Fair? California's Fair Play Act, AB 2404, and Gender Discrimination in Youth Sports. I'm joined by Amy Poyer uh, of California Women's Law Center, and we'll be giving more in depth introductions in just a moment. But let's just dive into the presentation. I do want to emphasize that we are always welcoming of questions and comments. So to the extent people have questions, please feel free to submit those uh, through the chat box or in, in any other manner that you wish. We'll have time at the end as well. And uh, we look forward to engaging with you on this topic today. Okay, so heading into the depth of the presentation here, let me just make sure I can advance the slide. One moment here. There we go. Okay, so Amy and I will both give a little bit of background about who we are in our nonprofit organizations, and then we'll start talking about the law. Amy, go, go ahead, please. Great, thanks, Kim. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Amy Poyer. I'm a senior staff attorney at the California Women's Law Center. Um, uh, CWLC actually celebrated our 30th anniversary this year, so uh, we've been doing this work um, now since 1989. Um, and that work is to break down barriers and advance the potential of women and girls through three main avenues, which you can see on the screen, and that's uh, impact litigation, including appellate work, policy advocacy, and education, which includes trainings like this one. Um, and we have four main subject areas that we do work in. Gender discrimination, which includes all of our Title IX work. We do work in several Title IX areas, but um, really have always, for the for the 30 years we've been in existence, have focused um, a lot on the Title IX athletics sphere and specifically uh, K through 12 um, athletics issues with Title IX, and particularly for low-income um, girls in uh, high schools in California. Um, and then we also do work in economic security, violence against women, and women's health. And if you want to learn more about um, all the wonderful things that our organization does um, and check out some of our resources in this area and other areas, you can check out our website, um, which you can see right there, cwlc.org. Great. Thank you, Amy. Okay. And then in terms of our organization, we are the nonprofit Legal Aid at Work. We have a specialized project, Fair Play for Girls in Sports, that concentrates on helping K-12 girls of color and girls in underserved low-income areas fight inequity in athletics. And we do that in a number of ways, including technical assistance like this webinar, limited representation of girls and their families, uh, as well as legislative advocacy and litigation when necessary. And we're based in San Francisco, but we serve all of California as well as many other states in the country. And uh, Amy and I are very lucky to do this type of law uh, as there are very few attorneys out there who are working on Title IX issues, AB 2404 issues for K-12 girls. 
uh, and we are a nonprofit, so we appreciate the community support and uh, and the interest in the topic today because one of our main goals is sh sharing information with all entities out there, uh, lawyers, families, coaches, educational institutions, and park and rec alike to make sure everyone understands the law. Um, just a side note, Amy and I are also athletes. Both of us played sports growing up. We continue to play sports to the extent uh, possible. And so this is a topic very near and dear to our hearts. Um, a quick note, so today's webinar is intended to be an informative general primer on gender equity law as it applies to community and school athletics, and this does not constitute legal advice. So if you are concerned that your park and rack has an issue or your school or there's something going on that you'd like to talk more about, you know, please consult an attorney for legal advice in your individual situation. You're welcome to call us, you know, for general notes and referrals, and of course we do take cases on, on occasion but we do uh, recommend that, that you understand this is just general information. All right, so agenda today, we are going to be talking about uh, a couple different things. We've gotten through in introductions. We're next going to talk about the benefits of sports for girls. You know, why are we even concerned about gender equity in athletics? Well, obviously girls benefit a great deal from participation, and so we'll share some key statistics about that. We'll then next go to the Title IX primer because the law we'll, we'll discuss later, the Park and Rec Gender Equity Law, is based on Title IX. So having that Title IX background will help you understand where the California State Park and Rec Law came from. And then we'll get into the nuts and bolts of AB 2404, the Fair Play and Community Sports Act, and we'll give a, a, a nice overview of that law so you'll have a nutshell version of it. And then talk about a couple of hypotheticals. You know, what does this mean, AB 2404, in my community? How does this play out in, in regards to park and rec, gender equity, and, and, and competitive athletics for youth? And then we'll take questions. As I mentioned, we can take questions as we go, but we'll leave a little time at the end for questions as well. Okay, uh, Amy, if there's not anything else to add in introductions and agenda, I will turn it to you now for benefits of sports for girls. Great, thanks so much, Kim. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, as Kim said, we always like to start these trainings by looking first at why it's so important that we're talking about these issues and talking about these laws. Um, and the reason it's so important is because there are real tangible statistical benefits to participation in sports for girls. Um, and that's beyond just the obvious joy that a kid gets from playing the sport itself. There's other really great benefits that can actually be measured and tracked from a kid's involvement in sports and particularly involvement um, at an early level and that, you know, we're talking about parks and rec programs here. Um, we're talking about kids playing at a, a young age, four, five, six. And that's really why it's important to set the scene. Um, and it's important that girls get the same access to all these benefits that boys are getting and that they feel valued in the same way that boys are feeling valued when they're they're playing these sports. Hold on. There we go. Thank you. Um, so first, there's obviously health benefits to playing sports. There's physical health benefits. You're getting your heart rate up when you're out there. You're running around. You're gaining strength from doing different drills and using different parts of your body and different muscles that you might not be used to using. And this first stat on this slide is one we always like to share because I think it shows just how far reaching the physical health benefits of, of playing sports can be and it's beyond what we all normally associate with playing sports with the running around aspect and, and all the things that I just mentioned. And that's that playing sports at a young age actually reduces the risk of breast cancer later in life by 20%, um, which is always just amazing to me, that statistic. And then just as important, I think, are the mental health benefits of playing sports. Girls who are getting physical activity, who are getting exercise at a young age have lower rates of depression. In that same vein, they have higher levels of self-esteem. They have higher levels of confidence when they get the chance to play sports. And getting them outside, getting them away from their phones, their computers, their social media, getting them breathing fresh air, enjoying the sun, interacting with their teammates and their coaches in person, not just over the internet. Uh, there's, these all have clear positive ben benefits uh, to doing those things. Oh, I think we skipped over one. There we go. Um, okay, yeah, so the first thing, we so we have academic and employment benefits as well. Um, and these are 
sometimes benefits, I think, that we don't uh, immediately think of when we think of the benefits of, of getting to play sports. So the first thing I want to emphasize here is that girls who play sports when they're at this young age, when they're four, five, six years old, and as someone who started playing soccer when I was four years old, I can attest to that, um, are more likely to play sports once they have that opportunity, you know, when they get to middle or high school. And I think not only that, and something that both Kim and I believe is really important, is that if you're taught about equity in sports at a young age, um, you know, that you should be getting equal treatment and equal benefits and the equal um, access to all of the sports that the boys are getting to play at a young age, you carry that expectation through once you're participating in sports in middle and high school. So it's really important that we start addressing these issues when these kids are at a young age and that they have these opportunities at a young age. So I think one misconception that people often have um, about sports and, and young people is that playing sports will actually detract from their performance in academics because they're spending time outside playing sports, they're not studying um, or doing their homework, they're out playing sports. But actually the statistics show the opposite. So girls who play sports have higher GPAs than their non-athlete counterparts they're 20% more likely to graduate from high school. And part of that is because playing sports allows for the development of really important skills and discipline that are needed to succeed academically. Part of it is also the health benefits that we talked about. You know, I think after running around, and we can probably all attest to this, I'm sure a lot of people that are on the webinar um, play sports themselves, you, your mind often feels clear, you're calmer, and you're able to focus better um, on 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 tasks and studying and other things that you need to do um, and then there's the employment benefits the second uh, point here of playing sports at a young age so there's actually as you can see a direct statistical correlation to playing sports and making more money later in life so the study showed that women who played sports women who played sports in high school earned seven percent higher wages in their career um, which is the, you know just amazing to talk about and really important that we look at um, how important it is, not only for health reasons, for mental health reasons, but actually for making money later in their career that um, girls be able to play sports at a young age. They're actually making more money. And then this one is always my favorite uh, to talk about. It's not on the slide, but I'll just mention it um, because I think it's so cool. And I think both Kim and I have seen uh, not only in ourselves, but in a lot of other uh, colleagues, attorney colleagues that we have, that they grew up either playing sports and very often played sports competitively in college, which I think goes along with playing them um, at a very young age. But 90% of C-suite executives for Fortune 500 companies that were women played sports growing up, um, which is just a huge number. 54% uh, of C-suite executives played at the collegiate level. And obviously I think there's um, a correlation there. So uh, yeah. and. Uh, just go go ahead back for just a second kim and this is what this is sort of the overview of what, what i've been saying this whole time is that playing community sports playing sports when you're young at four five six years old makes it much more likely that um for all these various reasons that you're going to play sports in middle school high school and maybe even have the chance to play collegiately go ahead Okay, so now that we have a basic idea of all the great benefits that um, girls like this that are playing soccer, um, these are my girls. This reminds me of me when I was, uh, you know, seven years old playing out there. Um, now that we have a great idea of what all these benefits are from playing sports, we're going to look at um, what the laws are requiring equity in sports. So we're going to start with Title IX. And as Kim said, Title IX um, forms the basis for AB 2404, which is the Fair Play Act, which is what Kim's going to talk about a little bit later. And Kim will discuss some of the differences between the Fair Play Act and Title IX. But Title IX is um, a really important starting piece for that law. So you've probably heard of Title IX, but in case you haven't, it is a federal law, um, which is different than the Fair Play Act, um, which is a California state law. Title IX was passed 47 years ago. And sometimes that surprises people that it's been around for that long, almost 50 years. Some people um, don't really know what it is, what it requires or prohibits, or who it actually applies to. Title IX applies to schools and more specifically educational programs, any educational program in the country that receives any amount of federal funding. And it has a broad mandate of what it um, requires and prohibits. 
Essentially, it prohibits gender discrimination in educational institutions. And that covers all kinds of gender discrimination, which um, you've probably heard a lot about Title IX covering sexual harassment, sexual assault on college campuses. Um, it also covers discrimination against pregnant students or parenting students. Obviously, for our purposes here, we're focusing on gender discrimination in athletics and its application to um, that piece of the law. So another important thing I like to emphasize about Title IX is that it requires the school, it's on the school to fix any Title IX um, violations that are taking place. So if there is known discrimination in any of these areas, the school has an obligation under the law to fix that. And then it applies to K through 12 schools as well as colleges and universities. The only requirement is that they be receiving any federal funding. Most private schools even receive some amount of federal funding through lunch programs or grant programs or other things like that. So it, it applies pretty broadly to all educational institutions. Um, next slide. So Often, um, you know, when Kim and I get a call from someone about a, a Title IX issue, um, it's from a parent or a coach that's looking at one specific sport against that sport's counterpart. Uh, a lot of times that's uh, softball and baseball. Um, it, can, it can be other sports, softball and baseball is when we get often because generally the, the facilities are different that softball and baseball play on. But we like to always emphasize when we talk to them that Title IX is a holistic law. So you have to look at the entire high school athletic program. You have to look at um, all the, the girls' sports together against all the boys' sports together. Uh, and that means that if a softball team is being treated much worse than a baseball team, that could potentially be offset if there's another sport, say the girls' soccer team, is being treated much better than the boys soccer team that would potentially be an offset and mean that there isn't a title nine issue so it isn't a one-to-one -one sports comparison it's a uh, looking at the entire school as a whole which makes sense if you think about the purpose of title nine being to prevent gender discrimination at the school you're looking at um all the the gender comparison overall and again no exception for football we get this a lot football is obviously a male um, dominated sport that normally doesn't have a a girl's counterpart but there's no exception um, taking football out of the equation either for counting the numbers of participation which we'll talk about in a little in more detail in a little bit or for treatment and benefits so if football is getting all these great things and that is all um male athletes or vast majority male athletes that are getting the benefits from that, then there has to be uh, some other treatment of female athletes at the school that is offsetting that treatment for football players. Um, so Title IX has uh, two, well, really three main components of it. So the first two are in the third bullet point, equal participation opportunities and equal treatment and benefits. And the third is in this last bullet point, retaliation. So equal particip participation opportunities is generally just a pure numbers issue. It looks at how many uh, girls are competing at the school versus how many boys are competing at the school. And is that allocation, those percentages, equal to the overall percentage of girls that are attending the school? And we'll see the counterpart to that in a second uh, in the Parks and Rec context. And then there's a couple exceptions to that law, which we won't go into detail in this presentation. Then there's equal treatment and benefits, which are um, the overall uh, intangibles that you think of for the quality of a sports program. So facilities, uniforms, scheduling, uh, fundraising, training opportunities, all of those things. And again, that's across all sports at the school. And then no re retaliation means that if you as a parent, coach, um, player, complain about a Title IX issue at your school, if you bring it up to someone at the school, you cannot be retaliated against for doing that. You can't be fired for doing it. The player cannot be punished and sat on the bench because they're complaining about it. Um, the law protects you from being retaliated against, which does not mean at some point it, it won't happen, but the law protects that, um, protects you from that happening. And there's legal recourse for that happening. Next slide, Kim. So this is an example. You can see the timestamp of, of these pictures. Um, this was a really pre great precedent setting case that both CWLC and Legal Aid at Work 
um, worked on for many, many years and continue to work on monitoring the school. Um, but this is this was the state of the baseball field on the left against the softball field on the right. And the baseball field you can see is pristine. Um, the grass is green. There's palm trees that have that were imported and, and planted in the background there of the field. There's an outfield fence. The softball field, on the other hand, um, you know, is it, there's dirt. There's not a lot of grass there. It clearly has not been kept. There's no outfield fence, and there's certainly no um, palm trees there in the background. So this is just a, a prime example of a Title IX issue with regard to facilities at the school. And the note at the bottom again goes back to the holistic analysis piece. If there for some reason was um, there was not at this school, but if there was another female athletic facility that was just like this, but in reverse, in much better condition than the male facility, uh, there might have been an offset and we might have not had a Title IX issue. That was not the case at this school. We did have a Title IX issue. We sued them. We pursued it um, to the appellate level. We won. Um, and now there's been some really great changes with that school because of that. Okay, so with that brief overview of what Title IX is, um, I just wanted to give this upshot of all that of where we are now. Um, so I said Title IX was passed in 1972, 47 years ago. Title IX has done a lot in 47 years to help girls play sports, but there's still a lot to do. So many of, many of you may have watched our women's soccer team uh, win the World Cup for the second time in a row this last summer. Uh, I actually had the great honor of getting to watch it in person. Um, I actually got to watch them win the last one four years ago as well. Um, two of the greatest experiences I think I've ever had. Uh, and I firmly believe that those wins wouldn't have been possible without Title IX. The players on that team um, I know because I know uh, I'm a fan and I've, I've followed those players for a long time. They all played youth soccer at a young age. Um, they got the chance to play collegiate soccer and they got a chance to benefit from scholarship money that potentially would not have been available for them to play collegiate sports at the highest level if Title IX um, wasn't in place. And now they're obviously be, uh, fighting to be paid equally as well, which I think is, is another example of participation in sports teaching you things beyond the field itself, like how to stand up for yourself, the worth of yourself as a female athlete, um, and just pushing forward and, and being passionate about uh, justice for you and your teammates. So the statistics before Title IX passed, less than 300,000 girls were playing high school sports. Now, more than 3 million girls play high school sports, so a tenfold increase since Title IX has passed. But uh, yes, that's impressive. Yes, that's great that 10 times more girls are playing. But getting back that we have more work to do, 3 million girls are playing, but 4 million boys are playing high school sports. So that's still a significant disparity. So how do we address that disparity? It's been 47 years. We still don't have equality. We have great strides, but not equality. And one of the solutions um, that both Kim and I have identified is that it's important to address this at an early age um, before these kids are playing high school sports because as i said at the beginning as we've said here as the world cup champ four-time champions know um when you're been if you've been playing sports since you're four years old you're more likely to stay in sports um believe that you can succeed in sports have the training to do so and take advantage of the opportunities that title nine is out there affording um female athletes we just haven't quite gotten there into equity yet so with that, I'll throw it to Kim to talk a little more about the Fair Play Act and youth sports at a um, younger level. Thank you, Amy. Terrific. All right. So now with that primer on Title IX, we're able to turn to the California state law, AB 2404, the Fair Play and Community Sports Act. Sometimes we call it the Fair Play Act. And this is a really exciting law because it is a very unique law and it is making changes. Uh, we're really on the forefront in California and the nation on this issue of equalizing park and rec youth competitive sports for girls and boys. Uh, the law, AB 2404, uh, was passed in 2004. It was sponsored and really carried forward by uh, then State Senator Daryl Steinberg, who is now the mayor of Sacramento. And it was signed into law by then Governor Schwarzenegger. 
and it became effective 2005. So we're now around 15 years uh, in, in the law being affected, effective, which, which is a good while. Um, unfortunately, there's still a lot of people who don't know about the law, have never heard of it, in, including park and rec institutions that are uh, charged with implementing it, uh, as well as you know local communities who can benefit from application of the law. Uh, we know a lot of uh, girls leagues in particular who could benefit uh, by getting you know equal access to facilities and you know better resources from the park and rec institution, and they're not getting those things, and and they need to know that the law is available to them in order to request equity uh, to resources and facilities and, and the like. The law AB 2404, so I'll interchangeably call it, you know, the Fair Play Act or AB 2404. It, it's a pretty simple law also, you know, and we can send it around after the webinar, but the text of the law is quite simple and approachable. Uh, anyone, a lawyer or non-lawyer could, could approach it and understand it, uh, but it requires gender equity and youth competitive athletic programming offered by and hosted through park and recreation departments. So that includes third party leagues that use park and recreation facilities and resources. And that has to be very clear because, you know, some park and recreation departments run their own youth competitive sports programs, and then others, uh, actually some of them, completely delegate the leagues to third parties and say, okay, you can use our fields and our gyms and our, our spaces here and, you know, the channels of this public agency, but we're not actually going to, to organize and carry out the league day in and day out. So they might say to, a, you know, a little league uh, baseball endeavor, you know, come in, use the fields. Do what you will. We'll give you the permit, but everything is everything else is up to you. And because those are public resources that are taxpayer funded and you know should be available to all girls and boys alike, it's, it's imperative that the park and rec consider not only their own programming and what they're doing, uh, but also the third parties that they delegate uh, to. Okay, so there's a private right of action in this law. A lawsuit can be filed against an agency or department, and arguably a third party could be part of that lawsuit. Uh, you know, if, if it became necessary, uh, a private right of action, you know, means that a community member can sue that park and rec agency if they feel there's a violation of AB 2404. Uh, admittedly, there has not been a lawsuit yet filed in the 15 odd years of the law. Um, you know, I'd like to think that's because park and rec are doing a good job. But frankly, I think it's because, uh, you know, a lot of community members are not yet aware of their right to do so uh, to challenge a park and rec if they're being gender inequitable. Uh, but, but we will see in the future what will happen there. Uh, but certainly there is a very strong enforcement mechanism. Now, right now, there's not an oversight agency in California. There's not one agency in Sacramento at a state level that's overseeing this law. Uh, maybe one day in the future there will be. Uh, in Title IX, we have Office for Civil Rights out of the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. that oversees Title IX implementation. But right now in the state, we lack that. So it's really up to Park and Rec and, and cities and counties and you know their attorneys and staff to be monitoring their compliance and learning about the law. And then, of course, community members should know about it as well. Uh, as Amy mentioned, we, just like Title IX, uh, AB 2404 grew out of Title IX. It's very similar to Title IX. So there's an analysis of participation opportunities and treatment and benefits in AB 2404. We'll get into more detail on that. But th those are the two major areas that this law focuses on to ensure that girls and boys are getting gender equitable sports opportunities. Okay, so this is just a bit of the text of the law, and I know on this webinar we have a number of attorneys that are in our audience, uh, and some non-attorneys as well. So we'll toggle between sort of legalese and, and more layperson speak. But here the, the, the Fair Play Act requires or says, no city, county, city and county, or special districts shall discriminate against any person on the basis of sex or gender in the operation, conduct, or administration of community youth athletic programs or in the allocation of park and recreation facilities and resources that support or enable these programs. So we're talking here with the allocation, as I mentioned before, if they allocate facilities and resources to Little League or a soccer league or a softball program or a tennis league, whatever it might be, uh, it has to be non-discriminatory uh, in, that, in that allocation. And then in their own conduct of their own community youth athletic programs, the park and rec department must be you know, not discriminating. And I just want to, to flag that, you know, this is about competitive sports. So there's language in the law that explicitly states that this is about competitive sports and not about clinics or camps. 
of course, clinics and camps can help support a league and create interest in the sport. You know, you might have a lacrosse clinic for girls one weekend, but that is not a sustained competitive league akin to some of the others that you see and wouldn't be analyzed under the law. Okay, so AB 244, what and where is covered? So park and recreation facilities and resources include, and this is direct from the law, but are not limited to. So these are the things, you know, when you're thinking about your local park and rec, think down the street, you know, wherever you live, uh, you drive around town and you see these things. And people forget sometimes uh, that these areas are public resources. So maybe you have, and I, I will often mention Little League Baseball because it's very strong entity in a lot of towns and cities and counties, and, and it's fabulous. It's great to have Little League. But, you know, Little League, in our experience, tends to dominate a park and rec allocation of resources. So you might know of a field in your town where you see a predominantly, you know, male Little League running, kind of running a field, you know, and, and kind of almost owning a field where they, they conduct their games and practices on one field in town, and you never see softball there, and you might not see any other sports there. And so they've been getting the permits sometimes for many, many years, and no other, you know, sports program has had access because oftentimes the park and rec is continually renewing that permit again and again based on historical usage and not thinking about wow should softball be in there should we rotate softball into that into that uh, diamond every so often to make sure it's equitably used so that's just one example of what is subject to the law so the athletic fields that any league gets or that park and rec use for their own league athletic courts you know tennis courts, gymnasiums, recreational rooms, uh, you know, that could be used for teams and, and meetings and things like that. Restrooms actually are a big issue in, in our cases and in our experience. You know, we do hear of situations where a girls league might have a field where there's really no restroom near the field or no good working restroom near the gymnasium. And yet the boys teams and leagues sometimes have better access to restrooms, you know, or the, the restrooms are cleaner or they're, lo they're less often locked, you know. Um, so those are issues in park and rec restrooms, and you know sometimes we see porta potties for the girls' field, and then boys will have cinder block restrooms with you know really good working showers and sinks and things like that. And then concession stands are a big issue. So if there's concession stands anywhere in the agency's property, we want to make sure that they're gender equitable, accessible to girls and boys teams equally. Storage spaces are big issues, and again you you might see a, a boys' league that dominates the storage space, locks it up, acts as though it's private property and in fact it's not private property and those storage spaces should be equitably apportioned to the girls and boys uh, participants uh, to make sure that they're not discriminating and then lands and areas access to permitting and leasing so that's kind of a catch-all for anything that they're giving out to sports leagues then we're talking also about equipment you know so I know of some park and rack that provide uniforms they provide helmets they provide bats and balls so if they're giving out equipment to their own leagues or third-party leagues um, there shouldn't be discrimination based on gender or sex. And then devices used to promote athletics, such as scoreboards, banners, and advertising. Now, this is another big issue. We, we see this where, you know, and it, we will use softball and baseball as a common example because we see a lot of inequity between those two sports in park and rec and in school. Uh, but typically we've seen softball not have a scoreboard at all at, at their at their facility in their area and then boys baseball will have a really nice scoreboard that with remote electronic access you know it's, it's bigger it's easier to see and softball maybe sometimes even just have the old sandlot flip flip chart for scoring you know things like that so we need to be assessing that and remediating that for equity and then banners advertising you know when you see again think of your town in, in town you drive around you might see the 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 new sports league advertised and are you seeing you know the girls banner the girls league banner being displayed just as in just as prominent a manner as the boys league uh, sometimes we see an equity there and then money used in conjunction with youth athletics should uh not be discriminatorily allocated um, and again we see a lot of park and rec subsidizing programs and, and park and rec needs to look at their their budgets and expenses and think wow you know when we look at all of our sports participants are we allocating a lot more money, you know, in coaches, in fields, in opening day ceremonies, you know, whatever it may be, in advertising and staff to these boy dominated boy dominated leagues and girls are, are then less likely to benefit. Okay, so more nitty gritty on the law. So that was kind of big picture about the areas that are covered. Now this harkens back to, to Amy's discussion of Title IX. 
So under AB 2404, we want to assess the participation opportunities. So the law literally says that the park and rec needs to examine and the community members can examine as well. Whether, this, whether the selection of community youth athletic programs offered effectively accommodates the athletic interests and abilities of members of both genders. So it's not about girls or boys in the law. Title IX and AB 2404 talk about equity and gender. So, and we really want to think about the underrepresented gender. So that happens to be girls in this day and age, but you know, one day it could be boys. So this is a really a gender neutral law that seeks equity for all, but right now we're working on girls because statistically and historically they are getting the short end of the stick. So community communities we encounter typically have 50% females and 50% males. Under the law, the gold standard in the law, and this is you know a standard reported from Title IX, is that you'd have competitive youth athletic programs that are 50% female and 50% male. And and so we we talk about it, that as the goal. And it, it can actually be achieved because girls in our experience and based on research, and there's a lot of great research of, about these type, types of issues, the Women's Sports Foundation and other, other research centers and advocacy groups have great research showing girls want to play sports uh, in numbers as great as boys, but the problem is they're not being um, included or welcomed to the same level as boys. And so uh, we need to make sure that, and we'll talk about this later, advertising, promotion, you know, opportunities are clear to girls because what we often see is advertising that shows the boy, you know, new basketball league at the park and rec. And you'll see pictures of boys in the in in the flyer, but you won't see a single picture of a girl. And you're thinking, well, girls don't seem welcome there. And then when the girl does sign up, she might be, you know, one of three girls on the team and the boys don't pass to her. And a coach does nothing to change that. And so that girl might not want to go back to that league. So there's a whole bunch of issues with participation, but it definitely starts with making sure girls feel, feel welcome. And once girls feel welcome and you establish strong co-ed leagues or all girls leagues and teams, the number can indeed come up to 50% female with the right adjustments to the program. Um, and then we're talking actual team members. The law looks at actual kids playing, not just lots offered. So it would not be a defense in the law to say, well, we offered a whole softball league, but girls didn't show up and didn't want to play. You know, we'd be wanting to count actual roster swaps occupied. But then that brings us to another part of the law that's really interesting, where if you don't have this gold standard of 50% female and 50% male in your competitive youth athletic programs that are run or hosted by Park and Rec, so count all the girls and boys and all the, the programs of the agency, then you can, the Park and Rec can show that all interests of the underrepresented gender is fully met. And so typically that would be girls, but you know, if you can show at a Park and Rec that you've surveyed the girls of your community in some meaningful way, and they don't want to play sports in higher numbers, that is a potential defense in the law to an action. If someone makes a complaint, you can say, well, our surveys show that girls are completely happy with the options they have and don't want to play in greater numbers. Now, in our experience, Amy and I find that girls always want to play in greater numbers. If asked, if they're surveyed, they say, yes, we want to play. And here are the reasons we're not playing. We don't know how to sign up or we played and no one passed to us. We need an all-girls volleyball team, not just a co-ed volleyball team, that kind of thing. So again, we can get into more detail on that, but uh, the law is flexible. The law is not forcing girls to play sports that don't want to play sports. The law is saying, just make sure you accommodate interest amongst the gen both genders to the fullest extent, you know, in, in, in if there are girls and boys leagues or co-ed leagues. Okay, so now, and we're gonna fly through this pretty quickly because there is a lot to cover and I, I wanna be mindful of time. So this is a primer and anyone who wants to call us later or send us emails can do so to get more detail. So we're talking about also under AB 2404, assessing equitable treatment and benefits. So there's a number of things, I'll just put them all up right here. Uh, so we're, we're looking at, in a park and rack under Title, uh, not Title IX, but AB 2404, the provision of money, equipment and supplies, scheduling of games and practice times, opportunity to receive coaching, assignment and compensation of coaches, access to lands and areas accessed through permitting and leasing, selection of sport, uh, of the season sport, um, as well as location of game and practices, locker rooms, practice and competitive facilities, publicity, and officiation. So I'm gonna get into a little more detail on each of these components, but you know, we list them all out this, in this detailed fashion because people aren't always thinking, for example, about officiation. 
you know, the quality of umpires and referees. Are you making sure that if you have a girls softball league and a boys baseball league, that the quality of the umpires are just as good for your softball league? And that those umpires have the same quality uniforms that the umpires for Little League have. have. You know, making sure to look at all those things. And then, you know, we've had cases and there have been cases in the past where, you know, you might have your winter winter girls soccer league uh, and then a boys spring soccer league and the girls are getting rained out of their games all the time. So, you know, that's happened in the past and those are the kinds of things the law wants to, to change. Okay, so just want to drill down into these, these little components uh, a little, little bit more in detail. So equipment and supplies, I mentioned before, uniforms, balls, goals, rackets, bats, protective gear, all those things should be inventorized to the extent the park and rack has those things in their uh, storage rooms and in their agency, want to look at what you have and, and how you're divvying it out to the different uh, leagues and teams. Scheduling of games and practice time. As mentioned, you know, about, uh, you know, softball and baseball sharing a diamond. Sometimes they share the same diamond. So make sure that you're not giving the prime weekend, prime time weekend slots just to Little League and then giving maybe an early morning or late night weekday slot to softball. And we do see that happen a lot. And, the, re the refrain we hear is that, oh, well, we've been giving, you know, this Boys Little League program the best slots for 50 years, and we, we never thought to do anything different. Well, of course, you have to make room for those girls' teams and make sure that they're getting equal dibs on those slots. And so using historical use permitting is a, is a major problem and, and should be revisited by a park and rec. Um, in terms of coaching, you know, assignment and compensation of coaching is critical. Number of coaches, so the ratio of players to, to coaches, making sure that if you're doing a volleyball program and you have 25 girls on a team and one coach, and that coach can't give a lot of attention to those girls, if it's a park and rec program, think about making sure your athlete to coach ratio is equitable between boys and girls teams. And this hypothetical, you know, you might see former high school players with no coaching experience in one league, and then another league has former competitive collegiate athletes. So that would be inequitable. And you really want to do an audit of coaches overall to see what their experience is. And then facilities. So locker rooms, practice grounds, competition grounds, as I mentioned before, concessions, bathrooms, scoreboards, bleachers. Anyway, just show this picture because this is the porta potty that we see a lot in our situations that Amy and I are, are examining. And then you, you know, you see this outside a softball field, and then you might see a bathroom like this next to the baseball field. And so, doing some rotation, making sure that the girls can access these types of facilities, and the boys get the porta potty sometimes is often a way to fix that. Publicity is a major issue. Um, park and Recs again aren't maybe thinking about this, but it's very powerful to add to any flyers, you know, images of girls playing basketball or playing lacrosse or tennis, making sure that it's not just a generic uh, flyer that says boys and girls. And also think about saying girls and boys. You know, you usually see boys and girls, but put girls first. And, you know, likely park and recs have far fewer girls playing. So it's important to kind of step up and, and really emphasize the girl participation. And then in any flyers, make sure to have prominent pictures of girls playing so that girls know they're part of that league. And I just want to quickly emphasize, too, usually Park and Rec, or many Park and Rec, have co-ed sports for young kids. Three, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds are being told, you can play soccer here. It's a co-ed league. Now, I played co-ed sports growing up. I have a brother. I like playing co-ed sports. But not every girl enjoys that. And it's sometimes very discouraging if a girl age four, age five is playing co-ed soccer, or co-ed basketball, and is, is getting pushed or, you know, it's a, there's some contact sports where a boy might be larger and dominating and, and the girls may struggle and then not want to come back and play. So we've heard from a lot of park and rec agencies that it's critical to offer all girls teams and leagues where necessary and where appropriate. So make sure that you're talking with your girls of the community to make sure if they don't want to play co-ed sports, that they have all girls options if they want that. And then, of course, some girls are still going to want to play co-ed. And there's, of course, girls that play Little League Baseball. And maybe they're one of, you know, two girls on a Little League Baseball team. That's okay as well. But make sure if, if the girls want to play all girls baseball or all girls softball, they can. And then collection of sports season, I mentioned about soccer program in the winter getting rained out and boys soccer would be in the spring in California city, our example city, the weather is worse in the winter and rainouts are common. So the park and rec needs to think about weather in assigning sports season and then conflict with school, make sure not to conflict with school schedule of sports, certified umpires, referees, and judges. I talked about um, 
be clear, you know, that referees, judges, umpires are equally allocated and supported. Okay, so I went through and picked off a bunch of the different uh, issues that AB 2404 looks at. I do just want to emphasize before we get into the typo, and Amy is going to help us with this, is that the big picture analysis of how many girls and how many boys are playing on your co-ed teams, co-ed leagues, girls teams and leagues, boys teams and leagues, is critical. Any park and rec or community member wants to try and get that data in front of them so that they can then decide, okay, where is the inequity and how can we work on it? So Amy, I'll, I'll turn it to you now. Great, thanks. Um, all right, so yeah, as Kim said, this first uh, hypothetical is going to go through the participation opportunities calculation. There will be a little bit of math. It, it won't be difficult, I promise. Um, so in our hypothetical, um, we're living in the city of Whoville. We have 200 people that live in the city of Whoville. Um, one Grinch, 199 Whovillians. Um, there's 100 adults, 100 children. 99 Whovillians and one Grinch. Uh, so of our 100 children, so that's under 18, we're split, which Kim said is normally the case, we're split 50-50. So uh, we've made the math fairly easy with this. We've got 50 boys playing sports, 50 girls playing sports um, at this Parks and Rec uh, department. And we're looking at the Whoville Park and Recreation Department. They offer several different um, sports, some competitive, some not at this park and recreation department. They have basketball, baseball, softball, soccer, tennis lessons, and a cheer class. So we're going to go through, uh, can you go to the next slide, Kim? The calculation for how we would uh, calculate what the participation numbers are and what we would need to do to comply with the law for participation opportunities at Whoville. So as we said in the last slide, we've got 50 kids participating. Um, as we also said, we have overall in the community, um, we, yeah, 50, okay, 50 kids participating. We've got 10 girls on the softball team, 10 boys on the baseball team, 10 boys on the soccer team, 10 girls taking tennis lessons and 10 girls learning cheer in classes. So what is our, what are our total participation opportunities for girls and boys in Whoville? So we've got 10 athletic opportunities for girls. Um, and those are the 10 girls that are on the softball team. So the 10 girls that are taking the tennis lessons do not count because tennis lessons are not a competitive um, opportunity. They're just, learning they're not um, actually engaging in competition with that and again the 10 girls taking uh, learning cheer and cheer class as we said the parks and rec uh, the fair play act is modeled after title nine and title nine makes clear that cheerleading um, in the vast majority of scenarios unless you are in a competitive cheer where you're actually competing against other schools or competing against someone else in a cheer competition general sideline cheer and in this case cheer classes would not um, would not be a competitive sport. So our 10 athletic opportunities for girls are the 10 on the softball team, 20 athletic opportunities for boys, those would be the 10 boys on the baseball team plus the 10 boys on the soccer team. Um, this means that twice as many boys are participating as girls. We have 30 total participants in the sports program at this Parks and Rec Center. Only 10 are girls, so we've only got 33% of the opportunities at this Parks and Rec program um, for girls. And as we had said, the percentage of, of girls in the community is 50%. So we should be at equal 50-50% for us, the athletic opportunities for girls and the athletic opportunities for boys here. Um, so that's what you see in the red in the bottom. We often like to calculate um, what would you need to do to be in compliance with the law, to be to have no gap and have um, the athletic opportunities exactly reflect the uh, the makeup of the community. And here we'd need to add 10 more athletic opportunities to girls because that would get us to 20, which would be equal to the boys. You could also add five for boys and 15 for girls. Um, more kids participating, we're always happy with. It's about the 
overall um, comparison between how many girls and how many boys are participating. So if we added 10 opportunities for girls uh, under the gold standard there, which is our number of calculations, um, we would be in compliance with the participation opportunities portion. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, and I just wanna address the question that we have pending that relates to this example. Uh, in terms of what is the you know definition of competitive or can we, can we expand upon that? So I'm happy after the webinar to send around more guidance on the definition of competition as it has been defined in Title IX and we believe AB 2404, you know, really imports Title IX standards. But competitive, you know, it's pretty simple actually in the sense that you, you, you can imagine what a competitive little league baseball program looks like. It's six or 10 games a season. It's practice. It's playing against teams in the city or even outside the city on a travel team, you know, competing with uh, a goal, you know, in mind. And sometimes there's playoffs, sometimes there's not, that's okay. But, you know, compare that to, again, a, even a two session clinic for girls on tennis, you know, or, or you know, lessons or, or clinics or, or even, you know, just a one-off sports demonstration. It's nothing like the competition that you get in a little league season for baseball or in a basketball season. So I think we instinctively know what competition means. Of course, there may be some gray areas, um, but, but inherently this law is trying to get at the, the fact that girls statistically, historically throughout the country in California, are less often getting that the same competition opportunity where they're working toward the goal of a game or a competition or a match each weekend or each week. Um, and that's what we need to resolve. So I hope that helps. Um, and then also I just wanna add how real this example is. So we use simple numbers and small numbers, but from surveying that Fair Play has done over the years, we find actually that on average, park and recreation departments are affording about 30% of their sports opportunities, athletic competitive opportunities to girls and about, you know, it, it depends, but you know, around 70% to boys. So boys are getting the lion's share of these sports opportunities, even though, you know, girls want to play just as much, you know, and, and park and rec are not often assessing and adjusting their offerings to say, oh, well, we have a lot of girls that want to play lacrosse and we have, you know, girls were turning away on basketball. We have girls in waiting lists in our basketball league. Why aren't we getting those girls in? So making sure to, to get those girls in is critical. Um, okay, so we can answer any more questions as they come up, but I want to go on to the next hypothetical. All right, hypo two, treatment and benefits. So we do, as we talked about these two main areas, participation is one bucket that the law looks at and, the, and then treatment and benefits is the other bucket. So in our hypo two on treatment and benefits, we have the tale of two leagues. League one is the Whoville All-Stars. Um, and then we have league two, the Whoville players. And we have in the All-Star League coaches who are former college players, uniforms are two sets of uniforms and new warm-ups, equipment, five bats, catchers, gear, mitts, and new balls. Facilities are reconditioned a reconditioned field with lights and an opening day parade is offered each year. So they have, you know, bouncy house and the mayor comes and throws out the first ball. And then we have league two, the Whoville players, where the coaches are former high school players. They care a lot, but they have no coaching experience um, at all. And they, they play to a lower level. Um, the uniforms are just one t-shirt, equipment, old balls, bring your own bath and mitts, facilities. They actually play on a soccer field that's adjusted for for their sport and there there's no chalk or sprinklers there's holes in the field and there's no opening day festivities at all you're not going to see the mayor at the whoville player opening day uh, game at all so you know of course i don't say any sports here but when i typically train on this you know the hands shoot up and say yep league one looks like our little league baseball in town league two looks like our softball league for girls maybe you have a couple girls playing in the in the all-stars uh baseball league and you know just don't don't let that be a red herring for you in your community where the, the parking rec might say, oh, this is co-ed, you know, league one is co-ed, girls are welcome. But then every team has 90% or 98% boys and girls make up, you know, 99% or all of league two. Uh, it still doesn't, just because a league is co-ed doesn't mean that it's gender equitable uh, because the proportion of girls that are experiencing inferior treatment and benefits here would be, would be a, potential violation of the law. And as Amy said, you know, maybe you can offset this, that maybe these girls, if this is softball and this is baseball with boys, 
maybe you have a soccer league for girls that's really well treated, you know, and you could say, look, we're offsetting. Let's look at all the leagues together. We're doing more for girls in another area. That's fine. I mean, of course, we want every kid to be treated equally. That's the best. But typically, we don't see that the parking rack is prioritizing any of the girls, and the girls are getting worse in every in every way. So you can fix this by, you know, starting the opening day parade for softball, rotate the field, make sure they're trading off, get, make sure the equipment's apportioned. And if you need new donations or you need to, to garner community support, that might be one way to offset inequity in equipment. Uniforms, the same, assess and remediate. And then coaches, you know, it's, it's actually pretty easy to tap new coaches for, well, it's not easy, I'll say, but it's possible to tap lo local youth and local coaches to, to come in and supplement where there might be coaching inequities. All right, so I think I've addressed the big picture there. And on this next slide, you know, what we just spoke about in the tale of two leagues, we need to assess and then make adjustments. And, you know, I, I say that and it sounds simple, but you'd be surprised at how many people just never look you know, closely at the, the data on the inventories, the coaching quality, you know, the number of participation opportunities. Back to, you know, thinking about the Whoville participation, sometimes in League One, they have a thousand boys playing, and in League Two, they have 500 girls playing. And League Two wants to expand, but the, the Park and Rec is saying, well, we don't know if we can find you fields to play on. But there actually are leagues that they could use. I mean, there are fields in the town where the, that the league could use. And so the Park and Rec needs to assess where they can let the Whoville player girls softball team expand. Let me just look at the question here that, that we're looking at. I'm not sure, Jenna, if I can see it very well. Um, Amy, are you able to read this question? Because it's not showing up for me. I think it's about keeping score. OK, we'll get that in just a moment. Yeah, I think so, you already answered that question, Kim. Okay, great. Okay, if there's nothing pending then. All right, so just in the last couple of minutes, we, we want to just note to you what to do next, you know, and a couple of best practice examples. So we do travel around all over California and beyond uh, talking about this law. Washington State also has this law. No other state in the country has a, an AB 2404 that I'm aware of, but even without this law, there could be a, a lawsuit filed against the park and rec. So it's good for every park and rec to be assessing for gender inequity, no matter what, you know, law or no law. It's really just even a moral imperative for us to be gender equitable. Uh, so we want to assess what the park and rec has and is offering. We want to adjust for equity to make sure there is equity and then achieve that with persistent, regular, you know, short and long term action and monitoring. And just to, to go line by line here, in assessing, we want to look at all the park and rec leagues, including third parties, for gender inequity. And we actually have a nice video we'll send to you after the webinar with third party leagues talking about how it's really easy for them to give their numbers to park and rec, you know, about how many girls and boys are playing. Park and rec holds the keys to the castle, you control the permits. Anyone working there can say, hey, you don't get a permit unless you tell us how many girls and boys are on your team and what kind of equipment you're affording them, that kind of thing. So count all the girls and boys playing is, is one example of assessment. Adjusting would mean, you know, greater outreach to female participants, rethinking the co-ed model, as I mentioned, which is a very big deal. Um, make sure that girls truly feel included. Co-ed is not always a good model for that. And then achieve equity, you know, with that short and long-term action and monitoring really means getting the Excel spreadsheet out, tracking everything, and then checking back in, you know, in three months, six months, one year, five years, have a strategic plan to make the adjustments so that if you only have 30% girls in your program, make sure to try and hit the 40% mark next year and 50% the year after that, you know, just keep at it. Um, so we're almost out of time now. Amy, I see one more question here. Let's see if I've got it. Can like, oh, it's, how does the law distinguish gender and sex versus sex? It's, to my knowledge, it doesn't. You know, I, we haven't seen that play out at all in the questions and queries and trainings we've had so far. I think it's, you know, obviously there's finer points to sex and gender and how they're defined, but this law is right now currently focused on pretty broad categories of girls and boys playing sports. Amy, anything else to add to that? No. Nope. Okay, I know we're almost out of time now. I don't know if there's any last questions, but we're going to send all of these materials to the registration uh, to those that attended the audience uh, as audience members today, and then anyone else can watch this webinar later if they didn't have time to join us live today. And we really appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.
Thank you so much, um, Amy and Kim, for presenting this webinar. Um, is Your Community Playing Fair, California's Fair Play Act, AB 2404, and Gender Discrimination in Youth Sports? Um, and thank you to our audience for attending. Um, you, we will distribute MCLE certificates after reviewing today's in-session times, and you will likely receive them within three business days. We hope that you will check out our next webinar, Identifying the Concerns and Needs of LGBT Older Adults, which is on Monday, October 28th, around 12 to 1 p.m. We have many more trainings in this series to come, and you can register by visiting lackonline.org and go to upcoming trainings. You can also find more information about this and other LAC programs and benefits by visiting our website at lackonline.org or by following us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also email us at trainings at lackonline.com, or sorry, lackonline.org, with any questions about our online and in-person trainings. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, all.